I see it lifts her head, however. She draws my gaze into the deep pools of her eyes. It's kind of hard to explain. She thinks of for a while, searching for the right words, then she says, then says simply, You know the, the dandelion flower? The one that scatters its seeds on the wind? Yeah. The wind carries those fluffy seeds far, far from where they were born. What if one of them ends up in a desert uh, where not even a single blade can grass a grass is growing? If you can imagine how that lone seed uh, will feel, then you might be able to understand me. Huh. So imagine a seed in a in just like a desert. It would feel very lonely. That's for damn sure. But I don't really know how else to take that metaphor. As I consider to say his answer, she continues her story. That seed is still a baby flower. If it does, if it does its best, it can turn even uh, a, a desert into a garden. Okay, but that would kind of be almost impossible. Maybe that little seed will decide to to thrive. Maybe it will decide to grow and multiply so that it can turn the whole desert into a field of dandelions. What do you think can give it the strength to do so? Um, uh, water? What? I whisper entrenched. Say a smile softly and caress and caresses my cheek. All it needs is to be loved by just one person in the whole desert. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't think love actually helps the flower grow. Maybe it does. I don't know. I don't know much about plants. All it needs to, is to be told how pretty dandelions are. The loving touch of her slender fingers fills me with peace and joy. I love you. I pull her into my chest, nodding si silently. Stay with me forever. Never leave my side. I promise. Basking in the soft warmth of our, um, of our love from each other, we sink into the oblivion of sleep. Okay. Back to Koji. Yep, I knew it. <clears throat> Koji's still alive. What is bothering him? Of course, the sound. The engine noise gradually fades into a low idling, then abruptly gives away so to silence, followed by the sound of a door opening and closing. This isn't a dream. These sounds are real. Understanding Kama comes like a sudden blow. This isn't the bottom of the sea. It's the circle of the light isn't um, uh, and the circle of light isn't the moon. It's the mouth of the whale. The sun has already risen and someone is right outside the, the, with the car. The last piece falls into place as he becomes Tono Koji once more. Help! Koji shouts surprised by how easily his voice emerges. His desperation blocks out and the pain from his raw throat. Hey, I'm down here in the well, help me! He keeps screaming with all of his might. Soon, the echoes of the cramped well become def deafening, and he is no longer certain if his screams have meaning or if he is just howling wordlessly. Nevertheless, he continues. His, his only desire is to, keep, is to be heard, lest he die for God at the bottom of this well. Koji's wait is not long, but even a minute feels like an eternity on the edge of the despair. Soon the circle of light above him is partially eclipsed by the silhouette of a person staring down into the well. Tono? You're alive down there? You're alive down there? A woman's voice. Koji has heard it somewhere before, but for some reason cannot remember who, to whom it belongs. Just hold on, I'll get you out! The silhouette vanishes, restoring the light of a perfect circle. Fear of being left alone again threatens to send Koji into a panic, but his reason has recovered enough to resist. Now that, now that he's free from despair, questions leap into, um, to the f uh, forefront of his mind. First among them, who is his savior? The rope shakes as the woman climbs carefully down. The beam from the fr floodlight slugs over her shoulder, pushing back the shadow cast by her body. Soon as she is standing in the same mud as Koji, and he finds himself face to face with... Doctor? Were you expecting someone else? Koji indeed has them, uh, had not imagined that his savior would turn out to be Dr. Tenbo Ryoko. Of course, it took him a, a moment to recognize her. Instead of a white brown and tight skirt, she is wearing a heavy leather coat, dim in jeans, and a boot with no heel. She must have expected a hike though through the mountains. Her light is um, uh, is a 
blocky all-purpose type feature side mounted forest runners runners in addition to the main floodlight sur survival gear and a professional grade by the look of it. Why does she have so much survival gear? I swear, she, there's something more to this doctor than meets the eyes, I swear. In the light of the lamp, Koji sees the sum of the stones are a different shade than the rest of the wall. This must be what Yuvarako was looking for. Oh, there's a secret entrance to the well? Huh? No, there there wasn't enough light. Huh. Yuvarako gazes, moves uh, slowly along the wall, finally coming to the rest on a gap between the two of the stones. The hole is just wide enough for an adult to reach into an open hand. You sure picked the right well to fall down, Ralko says with a grim smile. Like they say, it's always the last place that you look. She wastes no time thrusting her hand into the opening. After she feels around for a few seconds, Koji hears a think of something solid coming together behind the wall. Doctor? Ralko pulls her hand out and gives the different colored stones a gentle push. With the rumble of weight shifting, the stones slide smoothly back into the wall. So that's how he fooled me. I had no idea this was uh, this was here the last time I came. You've been here before? Koji wants uh, wants answers, but Ryoko ignores him and peers into the opening. In the beam of her floodlight, Koji can see a concrete tunnel leading into the mountains. I'm going on ahead. You better stay here. Her warning is utterly devoid of warmth. Considering his options, Koji looks forward from the tunnel to the rope and black and back again. He's practically sweating now, thanks to the 190 proof vodka he just drank, but although the feeling has returned to his fingers, he still doesn't have enough strength to climb. That said, the thought of him being alone in the well makes him shiver. I'll go too. Please take me with you. Huh? Have it your way. My uncle steps into the tunnel without looking back and Koji doesn't hesitate to follow. Ooh, finally getting some answers! When the light in her um, left hand and the shotgun in her right, Ryoko walks up to the door and takes a deep breath. Then she kicks the door open, putting her full weight uh, behind the blow. Oh shit. Well, with a disappointing feeble sound, the door breaks off, into, off its hinges and falls into the room. Dust bill billows like a white smoke in the beam of Ryoko's light. The room is large, at least 35 meters square. The tiled floor is set with drainage grates. There is no mistaking that the operating table sitting in the middle of the room, cabinets full of en enamelware and drugs line one side of the, the space, and against the opposite wall, a stand of uh, whiting desk and bookshelves. Finally, there are the indecipherable chalk patterns and symbols filling every available space on the walls. Even the two sliding blackboards are covered in strange, unreadable scribblings. Just looking at them is making Koji dizzy. Don't look! Ryoko snaps at him. Listen, don't move, and whatever you do, don't touch anything. Even if it's something that draws you your attention, don't look at it. What? What? You, what? Well, why not look? You, will you turn to a monster just from looking at it? If you see something that feels wrong, stare at your shoes, got it? Yeah. Ryoko switches her lights, fluorescent run runners on, and sets it on a nearby table where it can illuminate the whole room. She then holsters her shotgun, only to pull out even more confusing set of tools, a digital camera and a, and a can of spray paint. She gives the can in her left hand a good shake, switches the camera in her right hand on, and steps up to the blackboard while looking at the camera's side mounted screen. After recording one set of after recording one set of symbols, she covers it with the thick layer of paint, then moves on to the next. So she's recording the symbols for research and then erasing it so that way nobody else can, you know, use it. I guess that makes sense. Um, doctor. Lesson one: Never look at strange symbols or read anything written in unusual languages, like Latin. What? Use ca a camera to record them for later, then paint over the original. Now that she mentions it, Koji realizes that she's only looking at the screen of her camera, even then only in a short glimpse, and never directly at anything of the drawings. She He understands what she's saying, but it still doesn't make any sense. Why do you have to... 
Now that you've come this far, you better shut up and listen for your own good. Things like crystal balls and mirrors are dangerous. Anything can happen if you break them. So it's best to cover them with a cloth or paint over them for the time being. Koji begins to fear that the do this doctor might even be crazier than Fuminori. <laughs> Despite the burst of energy he receives from the vodka, Koji is still exhausted from his night in the well. The fear is affecting his body, making him dizzy and nauseous. Soon the walls are covered in black paint and the stale air is thick with the smell of turpentine. That should do it for now. Raoko says with relief, then tosses the empty can aside and pulls out away and pulls away her video camera. What happened to Oga? Koji asks, supporting himself against a nearby table. Hmm? Oh, he was over there. Without stopping her examination of the papers on the writing table, Raoko points no nonchalantly to a Chinese style screen standing in one corner of the room. He was there? Her, clinically, her clinical choice of tense makes her meaning instantly obvious. The urge to see for himself is irresistible. Koji staggers across the room to the screen, taking the utmost care not to tell a look at anything scary, scaly octopus thing that is painted on it. Behind the screen is a large easy chair. Although he's never met the man before, Koji is fairly certain that this person sitting in the in, in, is Ogai Mushikiko. What the what? He's dead? Ogai's corpse must have shrunk uh, significantly while drying in this sealed chamber. The body is barely the size of a child's. What? With one of the the business suit hanging from the bones, uh, offering any hint of Ogai's uh, former structure. His empty eye sockets and wide open jaw are filled with darkness. The same darkness that surrounded Koji at the bottom of the well. Compared to those gaping voids, the tiny hole in Ogai's right temple is almost dim dimmer. The revolver that has presumably used to kill himself is still clenched in his dangling right hand. What? Koji's vision suddenly dimmens. Dims. He's pushed himself too hard, and the Sarachi Vaka can't help him anymore. He collapses to the floor, unable to hang on to his slipping consciousness, and the last thing he sees is our Ogai's Mashikiko's gaping eye sockets staring at him. Oh, well, he's only passed out. For you.